Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call on May 6, 2020. Next slide, please. Zozocall content is directed to epidemiologists, laboratorians, scientists, physicians, nurses, veterinarians, animal health officials, and other public health professionals at the federal, state, and local levels. Please be aware that CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Today's call is being recorded, so if you have any objections, you may disconnect. Next slide. Detailed instructions for obtaining free continuing education are available on our website and will be given at the end of this call. These presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses or partners disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's presentation, Dr. Casey barton Baravesh, Director of CDC's One Health Office, will share some news and updates. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's Zohu Call, and welcome to all of our new participants. Our Zohu Call audience continues to grow with subscribers representing professionals from government, non-governmental organizations, industry, and academia, even including students. We have Zohu Call. Please continue to share this link with your colleagues from human, animal, environment, and other relevant sectors. The site includes links to past call recordings, information on free CE for a variety of professionals, and a link to subscribe to our Zohu Call email list and monthly newsletter. To begin today's call, I'd like to share some highlights from the One Health News from CDC, which were included with today's Zohu Call email newsletter. CDC's response to the COVID-19 outbreak is rapidly evolving. Please check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources including information about animals. All three of today's presentations will address topics relevant to COVID-19 and animals. Backyard poultry outbreak season has not yet begun, but CDC is aware of reports from hatcheries, feed stores, and in the media indicating record buying of baby poultry as a result of COVID-19. We've included links to related questionnaires and information. is proposing a new national system for animal diseases to strengthen the country's ability to detect, respond to, and control animal diseases. The comment period is currently open and ends June 1st. We have new information about several conferences. The 2020 Preparedness Summit has been rescheduled to August 23rd through 26th in Dallas, Texas. Infectious Diseases Week, or ID Week, is scheduled for October 21st to 25th in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the World One Health Congress in Edinburgh, Scotland has been scheduled for October 30th to November 3rd. Stay tuned to their websites for updates and confirmation of those dates. We've shared links to recent publications, including the preliminary incidents and trends of infections with pathogens transmitted commonly through food from the Foodborne Diseases Active Surveillance Network, there's also a report on Shigella Sanyai outbreak investigation during a municipal water crisis in Michigan. Recent publications in the MMWR of interest include geographic differences in COVID-19 cases, deaths, and incidents in the United States between February and April, as well as many other COVID-related topics. There's a note from the field article of interest, including Brucella abortus RB51 infections associated with the consumption of raw milk from Pennsylvania and the first evidence of locally acquired dengue since 1944 in Guam. Regarding outbreaks, the outbreak of listeria infections linked to enoki mushrooms has been updated. 
and an outbreak of E. coli infections linked to clover sprouts appears to be over. Please see CDC's website for updated information, travel recommendations, and resources related to the COVID-19 pandemic. A selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, as well as information on staying safe and healthy around animals, is available on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website, and you can find the complete current CDC outbreak list, including foodborne outbreaks, at cdc.gov outbreaks. As always, if you'd like for us to share news from your organization, or if you want to suggest presentation topics or even volunteer to present, all you have to do is contact us at zohucall at cdc.gov. Again, thanks for supporting the Zohu Call and for joining us today. We've got an exciting lineup of topics to share with you, and I'll now turn it back over to Laura. Thank you. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following objectives. Describe two key points from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. And identify two new resources from CDC partners. Next slide, please. Questions for all presenters will be taken at the end of the call. Please only use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions. You may submit questions at any time during the call. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question. Next slide. Our first presentation, COVID-19 and Animals, a One Health Approach to Learning about an Emerging Zoonotic Disease, will be given by Dr. Casey barton Barabesh. Please begin when you're ready. Thanks. If you'll go to the next slide, please. I want to start us off by saying a One Health approach is critical to address the COVID-19 pandemic as well as future health threats at the human-animal environment interface. One Health is an approach that recognizes that the health of people is closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. One Health is not new, but it's become more important in recent years, and this is because many factors have changed including interactions between people, animals, plants, and our shared environment. Successful public health interventions require the cooperation of partners who work to protect the health of humans, animals, and the environment. No single person, organization, or sector can address these issues alone, and collaboration across all relevant sectors can help us achieve the best health outcomes for people, animals, and plants in a shared environment. Next slide, please. Please hold a second while we get the slides back up. Sorry for the delay. All right. When investigating a new emerging infectious disease, it's always important to look back at what is known about other similar diseases. So I'll start off with the background on coronaviruses, which are a large family of viruses that are known to cause respiratory illnesses. They are named for the crown-like spikes on their surface and have four subgroupings, including alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Some coronaviruses cause cold-like illnesses in people, while others cause illness in certain animal species, such as cattle, camels, and bats. Some coronaviruses, such as canine and feline coronaviruses, infect only animals and do not infect humans, while others, like a severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, are examples of zoonotic diseases caused by coronaviruses that originated in animals and spread to people. Next slide, please. Looking at a timeline for emergence of COVID-19, this virus was first identified in people in Wuhan, China in December of 2019 and was determined to be caused by a new virus called SARS-CoV-2. Early on, many patients were reported to have a link to a large seafood and live animal market, but later patients did not have exposures to animal markets, which indicated that person-to-person -person spread was occurring. We also started seeing travel-related exportation of cases in the U.S., the first case was seen on January 21st. 
WHO declared a pandemic on March 11th, and you can see the cases in the United States at the website shown here. To go to the next slide, please. We still have quite a bit to learn about the animal source of COVID-19. We know that so SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus like MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV. All three of these viruses originated in bats and sequences from US patients are similar to the one that China initially posted, suggesting a likely single and recent emergence of this virus from an animal reservoir. However, the exact source of this virus is unknown and further studies are needed to understand if and how different animals could be affected by SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. While SARS-CoV-2 started off in an animal and spread to a person, it's now spreading person to person, and the virus is thought to spread between people who are in close contact with in one another within about six feet or two meters through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. These droplets can land in the mouth or noses of those who are nearby and be um, possibly inhaled into the lungs. Also, recent studies show that people who are infected but do not have symptoms can also spread COVID-19. Next slide. Looking at symptoms and complications in people can also help us better understand what to expect in animals. To date, symptoms of COVID-19 in people may include cough and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, or at least two of these symptoms, fever, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell. With COVID-19 in people, a wide range of illness severity has been reported, um, ranging from mild illness to severe illness and death. And the estimated incubation period is known to be two to 14 days. And there have been complications reported in people, including pneumonia, respiratory failure, and multi-system organ failure. Next slide, please. Although the clinical spectrum of illness for this virus remains largely undefined in animals, and though with a small number of infected animals, um, many being asymptomatic, we see that clinical signs are more likely to be compatible with SARS-CoV-2 infection in mammalian animals with a combination of the following. Fever, coughing, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, lethargy, sneezing, nasal discharge, ocular discharge, or vomiting or diarrhea. Next slide, please. Recently published research shows that non-human primates, cats, ferrets, and golden Syrian hamsters can be experimentally infected with the virus and can spread the infection to other animals of the same species in laboratory settings. Of note, pigs, chickens, and ducks did not become infected or spread the infection based on results from these studies. Data from one study suggested that dogs are not as likely to become infected with the virus as cats or ferrets. However, we do know it's possible. Studies in cats and ferrets have also shown that these two species can spread the virus to healthy animals of that same species that they're housed with. It's important to keep in mind that these findings were based on a small number of animals and don't show whether animals can spread the infection to people. The reference for the relative studies are shown here on the slide, and we know that additional work is ongoing in several countries around the world, and we expect to learn more over the coming weeks and months. Next slide. One Health is a team sport and strong partnerships are key. To help us learn more about how different animals could be infected by the virus, we must use a One Health approach. There are many more One Health partners than those listed on the slide, but I just wanted to highlight some of the ongoing collaborations in the US between local, state, and federal One Health partners, um, including Departments of Health, Departments of Agriculture, and state wildlife agencies, and also some of the ongoing collaboration with, at the global level with the tripartite, including FAO, OIE, and WHO. So as one example of One Health collaboration at the national and subnational level in the United States, state and local officials from departments of health, departments of agriculture, and when relevant state wildlife health agencies have been working very closely together with USDA and CDC and also DOI to rapidly investigate and exchange information on animals um, 
that are suspected of being infected with SARS-CoV-2, as well as the human-animal interface ecology aspects and public health concerns around this issue. So it's been a really strong and rewarding partnership that's helping to make a difference for human health, animal health and welfare, as well as well-being factoring in the human-animal bond and mental health needs during these stressful times. Next slide, please. CDC is aware of a small number of animals worldwide reported to be infected with SARS-CoV-2, mostly after close contact with a person with a confirmed COVID-19 infection. Animals around the world that are infected with this virus are reported to the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, and OIE keeps track of these notifications in a formal system called the World Animal Health Information System, or WAHIS. This timeline shows animals in black that have been confirmed and reported to OIE. Animals in gray um, have been shared with OIE but have not been officially reported in WAHIS. We've seen animals in households, zoos, and even mink on farms um, reported to be infected with SARS-CoV-2, again, mostly after close contact with people with COVID-19. And just to walk you through this timeline a little bit, in late February, we heard about the first animal in the world that was known to be infected with SARS-CoV-2. This was an asymptomatic dog in Hong Kong. A few weeks later, we heard the news of a second asymptomatic dog that also tested positive in Hong Kong. I'll talk in more detail about these shortly. Next came the positive domestic cats. First, a suspected um, and symptomatic cat in Belgium, followed by an asymptomatic positive cat in Hong Kong a few days later. Next came the large cat at a zoo in the United States, and then about a week later, the symptomatic pet cats in the United States. Most recently, at the end of April, officials in the Netherlands shared the news of two separate mink farms with SARS-CoV-2 positive mink and sick farm workers. So this just emphasizes that multiple animal species um, have been naturally affected with SARS-CoV-2, but it still appears to be an uncommon occurrence and is, again, mostly due to person-to-animal spread. Clinical signs in those animals that did develop symptoms were gastrointestinal and respiratory illnesses, um, while some animals were asymptomatic. It's important to share that those animals that did get sick had a mild illness and all have recovered or are expected to make a full recovery. And again, I'll talk more about these in detail shortly. Next slide, please. In the United States, USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, is responsible for confirming cases of SARS-CoV-2 in animals. They have a new website that lists cases of SARS-CoV-2 animals in the United States that have been confirmed in USDA's National Veterinary Services Laboratories. Of note, SARS-CoV-2 is considered to be an emerging disease by the OIE, and confirmed infections in animals should be reported to OIE. In the US, USDA is the authority responsible of reporting confirmed animal diseases um, in our country to the OIE. Next, I'm going to tell you about the animal and public health information on cases in the United States. So next slide, please. This is the story of the zoo in the United States, which had closed to the public as of mid-March. By early April, there were eight large cats, including five tigers and three lions, that were all housed near each other in one part of the zoo that developed respiratory signs, um, four tigers and three lions, while one tiger remained asymptomatic. These animals had the same caretakers in the zoo, and samples were test taken from the first tiger while it was under general anesthesia, and that tiger was confirmed to be infected with SARS-CoV-2, including confirmation being done at USDA's National Veterinary Services Laboratory. And this was um, reported as the first animal in the United States with SARS-CoV-2, and USDA reported that to OIE. Later, there were three other tigers and three African lions that had a cough that also tested positive um, for COVID-19. This testing was done by using a fecal sample test that was developed by the zoo's laboratory partners at Cornell and the University of Illinois, so it didn't require the animal to be placed under anesthesia. The fecal test confirmed the zoo's suspicion that the other seven cats had the infection and also determined that one other tiger that never developed a cough was also positive for the disease despite being asymptomatic. USDA confirmed the findings um, in the lions as well and reported that to OIE. 
So in summary, all eight tigers and lions in these two enclosures, seven symptomatic and one asymptomatic, tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, the good news is that the zoo reports that all eight of these large cats continue to do well, are behaving normally, are eating well, and their coughing is greatly reduced. All are expected to fully recover. And the investigation shows that these large cats were infected by a zoo staff person who was infected with SARS-CoV-2, but had not yet um, developed symptoms. So none of the other zoo animals, zoo cats are showing any signs of illness and zoos have put preventive measures in place for all staff who are caring for cats in zoos to prevent further exposure of any of their felids. Next slide, please. Now turning our attention to pet cats. There were two pet cats confirmed with SARS-CoV-2 in the United States. These cats live in separate households um, in different parts of New York State. Samples from the first cat were taken by a veterinarian after it showed mild respiratory signs, including sneezing and ocular discharge. No individuals in the household with this cat were confirmed to be ill with COVID-19. However, it lives in a community with a high incidence of COVID-19 um, infections in people. So the thought is that mildly ill or asymptomatic household members might have spread the virus to this cat, or this cat also had access to the outdoors, so it's possible that it came into contact with an infected person outside of its home. There were no other pets in this household. For the second cat, samples were taken after the cat showed respiratory signs, including sneezing, cough, and ocular and nasal discharge, as well as being lethargic. The owner of the cat was a confirmed COVID-19 case and was sick before the cat became ill. There was a second cat in the household that shown no signs of illness. So samples from these cats were taken, um, were tested by SARS-CoV-2 PCR after testing negative for other respiratory pathogens by a private laboratory. Both cats tested presumptive positive at a private lab, which then reported the results to state and federal officials and USDA was able to confirm those both cats are recovered and doing well. Next slide, please. So now turning our attention globally and looking at dogs. Dogs have also been reported to be infected with SARS-CoV-2 with two asymptomatic dogs in Hong Kong. The first was a 17-year-old Pomeranian with underlying health issues. The dog was SARS-CoV-2 positive by PCR and also reported to be seropositive. The dog's owner was a person with a confirmed COVID-19 infection. The second Hong Kong dog that was also asymptomatic was a two-year-old German Shepherd. Lab findings showed that this dog was positive by PCR, was seropositive, and virus isolation was successful for this dog. Of no investigation um, into a dog, specifically an adult pug with mild symptoms, including cough and a decreased appetite. This dog has not yet been confirmed, but was tested positive through a university research study and has been covered widely in the U.S. media, so I wanted to share that information with you all. Three out of four family members were confirmed with COVID-19. The dog was one of three pets in the home, and it was reported that there was no transmission to the other dog or cat in the household. This dog had close contact with symptomatic people in the home. The owners reported that the dog licked their plate, slept in their bed, and had regular close face-to-face -face contact. An investigation is ongoing, and USDA's National Veterinary Services Laboratory is conducting additional laboratory assessments, and we'll learn more in the coming days. And this is just an example of why it's important to have positive findings confirmed at USDA, and again, so USDA can report those to OIE. Next slide, please. Now turning our attention to wildlife, there's currently no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is present in any free living wildlife in the US, including bats. In general, coronaviruses don't cause illness or death in bats, but we don't yet know if this new coronavirus could make North American species of bats sick. Bats are, bats are an important and part of our natural ecosystem and their populations are already declining in the US. So there are concerns that bat populations could be further threatened by this virus or harm might be inflicted on bats resulting from a misconception that um, bats are involved in the spread of COVID-19. 
So we know further studies are needed to better understand if and how bats could be affected. Next slide, please. Given what we've learned about cats, mink, and ferrets, there have been increased concerns over the possibility of free-ranging mustelids and felids becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2, and One Health partners are collaborating to help protect these free-ranging species. Next slide, please. So to summarize what we know about animals and COVID-19, it appears that the virus that causes COVID-19 can spread from people to animals in some situations, and we're learning more every day. At this time, there's no evidence that animals play a significant role in spreading SARS-CoV-2. Based on limited information available to date, the risk of animals spreading SARS-CoV-2 to people is considered to be low. There is no justification to take any measures against animals that could compromise their welfare. Animals don't need to be euthanized or abandoned because of SARS-CoV-2 concerns. Again, of the few animals that have been infected, most are asymptomatic or mildly ill and have fully recovered. It's still important to note that further studies across One Health partners are needed to understand if and how different animals, including pets, could be affected by SARS-CoV-2 and what role, if any, animals may play in the spread of COVID-19. Next slide. So now let's address how to protect yourself and others from COVID-19. CDC has detailed advice on our website pictured here with information on how to safely practice So we know more about this virus, we're advising you to treat your pets like human family members. Don't let pets interact with pets or other animals outside of the home. Keep cats indoors to prevent them from roaming freely outside. Walk dogs on a leash six feet or two meters away from other people or animals. And avoid dog parks and other places where people and dogs um, are known to gather. Next slide, please. CDC also has advice on what to do if you are sick. If you're sick, stay home. It's important to note that most people recover at home without needing medical care. Stay away from people and animals as much as possible. Wear a cloth face covering over your nose and mouth if you must be around other people or animals, even when you're at home. Keep your distance and cover your coughs and sneezes if you need to be around other people. Clean your hands often. Avoid sharing personal household items. Clean and disinfect frequently touch objects and surfaces. And of course, monitor your symptoms for emergency warning signs, including trouble breathing and sick medical care quickly when needed. So we know that pets are providing us with such important emotional support right now. When possible, have another member of your household care for your pets. Avoid contact with pets, including petting, snuggling, being kissed or licked, and sharing food or bedding. If you must care for your pets, wear a cloth face covering and wash hands. And if your pet gets sick, call your veterinarian and talk to them. Let them know you're sick with COVID-19 and find out more about how to take care of your pet. And then when you're back to good health, you can go back to, to interacting and snuggling with your pet again. Next slide. Because all animals carry germs, it's also a good idea to animals, washing, handling animals, their food, waste, or supplies, practicing good pet hygiene and cleaning up after pets properly. Talk to your veterinarian if you have questions about your pet's health. Be aware that young kids, people with weakened immune systems, and people um, over 65 are more likely to get sick from some germs that animals can carry. And you can learn more on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website about staying safe and healthy around animals. Next slide. To conclude, a One Health approach is critical to address the COVID-19 pandemic and future emerging infectious diseases. To learn as much as we can about this virus, we must pay attention to ecological settings where people and animals live, as well as how they interact with each other. Though this emerging zoonotic virus started off in an animal, the current spread of COVID-19 is primarily a result of person. Significant role in spreading SARS-CoV-2. Based on limited information available to date, the risk of animals spreading SARS-CoV-2 to people is considered to be low. More studies are needed, including those involving One Health collaboration to better understand if and how different animals could be affected by the virus that causes COVID-19. 
And this is a rapidly evolving situation and CDC and partners will continue to provide updates as new information becomes available. Next slide, please. We just wanted to share some trusted scientific resources where you can stay up to date. We encourage you to follow them closely and you can also get updates from these groups on social media. Next slide. around the world. Back over to you, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Barton Baravesh, and I apologize for some of the audio issues that we are experiencing. Um, our next presentation, SARS-CoV-2 USDA Response, is by Dr. Mia Kim Torchetti and Dr. Christina M. Loyakano. Please begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and, and I'll be, I'll try to be relatively brief, just going to try and review some of the um, testing that we have ongoing here at um, the National Veterinary Services Labs. I'm the Director of uh, Diagnostic Virology here. Uh, next slide. So our current status, um, as you've already heard uh, from, from Casey, we are um, actively testing uh, using real-time PCR, the nucleocapsid target CDC assay conducting virus isolation, sequence attempts, both partial and next generation methods, as well as um, virus neutralization using live virus. And we're following the OIE guidance for recommended samples for oral nasal um, and rectal fecal samples. Next slide. So um, in the early days, I'm sure um, many of you were as uh, surprised as, as, uh, as I was as at the rapidity at which um, both the characterization of the virus and the diagnostics um, kind of basically exploded. Um, we had um, rapidly four uh, published assays available and the list of available assays right now continues to grow. Um, um, it's, it's, it's quite surprising and amazing, um, but given the circumstances, it's good to know that we can have those resources, but as that, re re as that list grows, it makes it harder sometimes to um, identify uh, the best um, um, assays as they come online. For DVL, um, we selected the CDC assay. Uh, we used uh, research use only reagents obtained through IDT, uh, targeting the nucleocapsid. Um, next slide. And for our verification uh, testing, we used our um, plasmid control that was provided uh, with IDT. Um, and we included an endogenous control for beta-actin and internal control for xeno for our animal testing. We also, uh, we tested um, a variety of uh, uh, other coronaviruses to um, rule out um, cross-detection of other coronaviruses, um, used the viral RNA, some synthesized RNA uh, for doing analytical sensitivity specificity, um, looking at the uh, respiratory and fecal matrix material, um, and the, um, again, a, a, a broad panel of um, viruses that uh, many of which were shared through our NALAN partners, our National Animal Health Laboratory Network uh, partners that you'll hear more about here in just a minute. Um, we also wanted to quickly evaluate um, enzyme and extraction reagents to make sure that we were not um, consuming uh, reagents that would be needed for public health use. Next slide. Sorry. Um, for our exclusion testing, we had 22 different coronaviruses tested against the CDC assay. All have been negative thus far, and we certainly are on the lookout for um, others that we might go ahead and try. As I mentioned, it's um, RNA from several species, bovine, canine, equine, feline, porcine, and a human origin virus spanning several different subgenera. Um, our non lab partners, which again you'll hear about in just a minute, ha um, have also conducted and continue to conduct um, similar type approaches for other assays, including the German assay, um, I believe uh, one that's being um, developed, been put out by TetraCore. Next slide. So the other aspect of this was to make sure that we weren't cross detecting um, SARS-CoV-2 on our other animal um, coronavirus assays. And so uh, some of this work has also been done both at NBSL and the NALM labs. Um, and some examples include the um, PED virus, porcine epidemic diarrhea, uh, transmissible gastroenteritis virus, porcine delta corona, and uh, porcine hemagglutinating encephalomyelitis virus. And of course, we will continue these efforts as time and resources allow. Next slide. 
for sequencing approaches, um, our USGS partners uh, were able to share their uh, BEI virus propagate ahead of when we could actually get it from BEI, and this is under an emergency exemption. We really appreciated their help and support in that. Next generation sequencing methods and data pipeline development included testing of other animal beta coronaviruses in addition to the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, from BEI from Washington. We also have uh, regularly used Sanger method target targeting three genes and we'll continue to evaluate other targets as needed. Next slide. For virus isolation, our approach is similar to CDC, um, provided the, uh, the citation there. For respiratory samples, we're using the Vero CCL81s. For rectal and fecal samples, we're actually using an approach to um, use our Vero 76s with trypsin, and this has worked well for that type of sample. Multiple passages in cell culture may be required, and of course, this presents us with a little bit of challenge with um, um, a positive is a positive, but uh, sometimes it's, it really takes us a little while to get through um, negative testing. Any virus isolates are characterized by whole genome sequencing as well. Next slide. Um, you've already seen some of this, so I won't belabor it. Um, we're aware of where the, the confirmations have been made here at USDA, and we've included links as well. Next slide. Oh, and now I can hand it over to Dr. Christy Lou Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Christina Loyakino, coordinator for the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share how the NALN, or the National Animal Health Laboratory Network, is supporting the response to COVID-19. And just to give you a little background on the network itself, the network was established in 2002 as a federal and state partnership. Two agencies within USDA worked with the American Association for Veterinary Laboratory Diagnosticians to identify laboratories around the country with expertise and a strong infrastructure to take on testing for diseases of high consequence in animals. And those would include things like foot and mouth disease, uh, African swine fever, and high path avian influenza, just to name a few. The purpose of the NOM is the same today as it was in 2002. We provide early detection of high consequence animal disease through targeted surveillance, rapid response through surge capacity should a disease be confirmed in the U.S., and appropriate recovery or testing at high numbers of samples after an outbreak to provide our trade partners and consumers confidence that we are truly free of the, the, the disease. Currently, we have 60 non-laboratories in 42 states in the U.S. They are primarily state and university-associated veterinary diagnostic laboratories, and they do their routine endemic testing for their states and their region, as well as the testing that they do for the NALM. Next slide, please. This is a map that shows the distribution of NALM laboratories around the U.S. So each blue and green dot represents an individual NALM laboratory. The green dots are those NALM labs that are capable of testing for SARS-CoV-2 in animals. The green dots with the black circles are non labs that can test for SARS CoV 2 in human samples as well as animal samples. And then the red stars identify the locations of our National Vet Veterinary Services Laboratories or the NVSL reference labs. So, all presumptive positive test results um, in the non labs for our testing must go to the reference laboratories for confirmatory testing. And we're currently treating SARS CoV 2 in a very similar manner. So, any non laboratory that tests animal samples and comes up with a pre presumptive positive, they send those samples to the Ames location for NVSL for confirmatory testing. And if NVSL does identify and confirm that positive result, then uh, USDA will report that to the OAE emerging disease reporting process. Next slide, please. Currently, we have 27 non-laboratories testing for SARS-CoV-2 with a capacity across those labs to provide over 12,000 PCR tests in 24 hours. And that capacity, of course, could be affected by shortages in reagents, supplies, and equipment, and that's kind of what we're seeing around the U.S. Um, right now. The shortages not only affect the capacity for SARS-CoV-2 testing within the non labs, but they unfortunately also affect the capacity to test for our other non scope diseases. And many of the non-laboratories have been asked to support their state's COVID-19 response by sharing equipment, reagents, and even analysts 
with their public health labs. And then seven of our, our non-laboratories are, uh, again, certified to test human samples as well as animal samples. Now, some of those labs have a very separate process for the human sample testing that doesn't impinge on capacity to test for animals, but other labs are utilizing their animal capacity. So again, their uh, equipment and, and analysts primarily to support the human testing within their state. Testing of animal samples in the non-labs is typically completed at the request of the state animal health official or state veterinarian in collaboration with the state public health veterinarian. And I'll provide a little bit of guidance on the next slide. Um, but right now, I, I wanted to focus on the fact that the non-labs that are testing for the SARS-CoV-2 um, or using that assay are part of a working group. And we meet weekly with NVSL and Dr. Torchetti to discuss technical aspects of the assays being used out there. Um, as Dr. Torchetti mentioned, there are many assays available, but most of the non-labs are currently using an assay based on the CDC protocol. But we're also trying very hard to use reagents that are not required for human testing, so not to impinge on that capacity. Within this working group, we're also starting to discuss serologic testing as some of the non-laboratories are developing that capability. And we do feel that that's going to expand quite a bit in the near future. And we also address any concerns within this working group, um, including the shortages that we're seeing in reagents, kits, and supplies, including PPE. And we work together to try uh, to um, discuss this with vendors, potential vendors, and uh, across our network to try to meet the demands um, that we're seeing. Okay, next slide, please. So again, the decision to test animal samples in the non-laboratories is determined at the state level. And in order to help with this decision-making process, guidance has been collaboratively developed by CDC, USDA, FDA, and others using a One Health approach. Um, and this guidance can be adapted by state and local animal and health departments to respond to rapidly changing local circumstances. And the bottom line and our, our main message is that routine testing of animals for SARS-CoV-2 is really not recommended. And this is based primarily on the fact that there's really no evidence for a significant role of animals in the transmission of this virus among people. Um, also uh, of concern is, is, is uh, conserving, conserving sorry, uh, reagents um, and supplies for the human health testing. If a decision is made to test the animals, again, this should be agreed upon using a One Health approach between the appropriate local, state, and federal public health and animal health officials. And that should be based on the recommendations, and many of those recommendations are listed here in this table, and to help guide the priorities for animal testing of SARS-CoV-2, again, given those limited resources. We do strongly encourage veterinarians to rule out the more common causes of illness in animals before considering SARS-CoV-2 testing. And this information shown on the slide, as well as other pertinent information, can be found at the website shown at the bottom of the slide, as well as the USDA's APHIS One Health uh, website. And I'm just going to throw in here uh, uh, another bullet point. You may be aware that testing is also occurring in private commercial laboratories around the country that testing in animals for SARS-CoV-2. We've been able to have discussions with um, several of these private laboratories. And luckily, those that we've been in contact with seem to really support um, the use of these guidelines and plan to uh, restrict somewhat the testing that are, that's going to be done in animals. So that, again, that's good news. And next slide, please. So based on the support of these guidelines at the state level, the overall testing in non-laboratories has really been kept to a minimum. We've currently tested only approximately 150 animals, and those uh, the animal types are listed on this slide. 80% of the cases that have been tested in non-labs are dogs, cats, and ferrets. Most of the animals that have been <clears throat> tested are, were reported as clinical, meaning primarily that they had respiratory signs, mostly mild. And those non-clinical animals tested were either in direct contact with people confirmed or suspected to have COVID-19, or were species with special consideration, um, some of which are listed on that chart on the previous slide. We're currently asking laboratories, the non-laboratories, to provide the animal testing numbers on a weekly basis, so we can try to keep a, 
um, keep that monitored. Um, and we do believe that these numbers will remain low, again, based on uh, the current guidance that's out there and the need to conserve supplies needed for human testing. And we do believe the human testing seems to be ramping up, so that's going to become very important in the coming weeks. But uh, non labs will continue to support the needs of their state on both the animal and human testing fronts. So the final slide, please. This is just contact information for Dr. Torchetti at the National Veterinary Services Laboratory, as well as contact information for the, the NALM program office. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to share the information. Thank you. Our final presentation, Precautions When Caring for Suspected SARS-CoV-2 Infected Animals, Veterinary Facilities and In-Home Isolation, is by Dr. Ryan M. Wallace. Please begin when you're ready. Hi, thank you. Uh, so I am, when we're not in pandemic mode, the head of the Rabies Epidemiology Unit, so I do normally work on the zoonotic disease, but I've had the pleasure to now serve as the deputy to the COVID-19 One Health Working Group and work with quite a few people to put this guidance together. Uh, you've gotten a great background on uh, the current situation of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 in animals, and a lot of that rationale has gone into the development of, of this guidance. Next slide. Casey already shared some of these, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but just wanted to point out that there are several uh, animals and SARS-CoV-2 guidance documents that are available on CDC's website. Uh, largely, these were created uh, when we recognize there is a need or a lack of guidance that is uh, coming from the human side of, of, um, of CDC's content. Next slide. All right, so we're going to focus for the next, hopefully, just about 10 minutes to save some time for questions and answers on the veterinary guidance that was posted uh, just in the last week. Next slide. This guidance was developed to facilitate preparedness and ensure practices are in place in companion animal veterinary clinic settings to help people and animals stay safe and healthy. Uh, the audience is, it's really key here. We did get quite a bit of feedback right after this went live on, on a little bit of confusion about who, which veterinarians we're specifically referring to. Um, so it's important to know we're, we're talking about veterinary facilities, not, not just clinics. This guidance will be relevant to, to quite a few settings, but it is written from the perspective of companion animals, animals that spend time in people's homes. That's important to keep in mind as we go through this guidance or as you go through the website. The key messages in this guidance, you have heard quite a bit already. Um, there is very little data, but what we are seeing is that the risk of animals spreading COVID-19 to people is very low. Uh, there is re the, the recommendation to postpone elective procedures and non-urgent veterinary visits, visits, but because the pandemic is consistently changing, uh, these these decisions should really reflect local ordinances and guidance. It's not going to be a national directive. Uh, we need to support pet medical needs through telemedicine or curbside uh, appointments when possible, and then proactively communicate to both staff and pet owners the need for them to stay home if they are feeling ill. Next slide. The, the rationale for why we decided to develop this guidance specifically um, again, we don't quite know what that role is for pets in transmission. It appears to be quite low, but we're continuing to monitor the situation and learn more as more uh, studies and epidemiologic observations are released. Veterinarians face unique risks, uh, not just from their clients, but also potentially from their patients. They're also being asked currently to balance PPE supplies that are uh, being used on the human health side. Um, there's limited evidence for an infection from animals, but there is uh, quite a risk of, of exposure during their interaction with clients. The guidance that is in this document comes from several sources. Uh, first off, where applicable, we have tried to keep it consistent with human guidance. Uh, I was very surprised how the dental guidance for COVID-19 actually overlaps quite a bit with what we tell veterinarians. We also try to make sure our messaging is consistent with partner organizations such as AVMA and NASPHV, and not just their current COVID-19 guidance, but also standard precautions and standard guidance documents that are, um, should be quite well known to the veterinarians that are practicing. And then where there were gaps in these first two uh, sources, we relied on scientific evidence. And as you saw from Casey's presentation, that is quite limited at this time. Next slide. These are the main 
areas of the guidance that I'm going to touch on today. Um, to save time, let's just go to the next slide and jump right into it. So if you've been on CDC or ABMA's website, you've probably seen this, this upside down pyramid, the hierarchy of controls. Uh, just to point out, PPE is the, the very bottom level of control. There are a lot of things we can do to prevent exposures before relying on our PPE, which is eliminating the hazard, substituting our work practices for things that are less risky um, and changing the way that we work. So that, those will be reflected in quite a few of these recommendations. So um, first, protecting workers' safety. This uh, really should be a no-brainer. Advise ill veterinary clinic staff to stay home. Um, ask staff to stay home if they're sick. Employees who appear to have symptoms when they arrive to work or become sick during the day should immediately be sent home. And they should not return to work until their fever is absent for at least 72 hours without the use of fever-reducing medications. Uh, their symptoms have improved and at least 10 days have passed since symptom onset. This is guidance that's consistent throughout CDC's website. Everyone who enters the clinic should be wearing a cloth face covering unless they're engaged in activity that would require some form of more advanced PPE. Next slide. No actions to take if a pet owner has suspected or confirmed COVID-19. So if a pet owner currently has respiratory symptoms or is a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 case, they should not visit the veterinary facility. They, the veterinarian should be communicating via phone call or video chat to maintain social distancing, uh, again, while balancing the, the, the welfare of that animal, which should not be jeopardized through any of these measures. Uh, and then if the animal does need to come into the clinic, try doing curbside pickup to try to limit as much interaction with those owners as possible. And then every effort should be made to prevent ill persons from entering the clinic, uh, again, without negatively impacting animal welfare. Next slide. Screen pets for exposure to people with COVID-19. And this will be an important part of the, the risk assessment when determining what PPE to wear when working with an animal as well. But before scheduling appointments uh, or upon arrival, a staff person should ask if the pet has had any exposure to a person who suspected or confirmed COVID-19 and also assess clinical signs that that animal might have. Next slide. Evaluate the animals to determine if they should be tested for SARS-CoV-2. It's been said a few times, but routine testing is not currently recommended. Uh, with the, the veterinary staff should take a thorough history to assess for likely exposure in the two weeks prior to symptom onset. Those exposures include contact with a confirmed COVID-19 person, someone with compatible symptoms, or exposure to a high-risk environment, such as a long-term care facility. Veterinarians who have evaluated an animal and determined that it is consistent with SARS-CoV-2 testing guidance should immediately contact their state public health veterinarian or animal health official to discuss, uh, what, to discuss that patient and determine if testing should proceed. Next slide. Determine if you need personal protective equipment. So there is a table on, on this website within the guidance. It is quite informative, but uh, I want to warn everybody, it, it, uh, it is quite detailed and it has quite a few footnotes beneath it that help explain uh, in more detail the, the PPE guidance. So please digest this both in terms of the table and the footnotes all together. We've, we've received some feedback and tried to make some, some um, corrections to make it more clear. The key thing here before even approaching this table is we're expecting veterinarians to use their professional judgment. Uh, the symptoms, the, the clinical signs of SARS-CoV-2 in animals are quite non-specific uh, non ranging from mild respiratory disease to GI issues. Uh, so it, it really is up to the professional judgment of the veterinarians to determine if they think this animal should be suspicious for SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that suspicion should be based on the other, uh, the other medical conditions that the animal has and the potential for exposure to SARS-CoV-2. The situations where no additional PPE would be required are when you're working with a healthy pet or a pet that has no suspicion for SARS-CoV-2 infection and no epidemiologic links to a, SARS, or to a COVID-19 patient. Uh, additional PPE precautions, but no N95 should be used when the animal is suspicious for SARS-CoV-2 and aerosol generating procedures on animals without an EpiLink. And then full PPE, which includes the N95 or an equivalent should be used when performing aerosol generating procedures on animals with an epidemiologic link to SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. 
any procedure where a person with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 is going to be present in the room. Next slide. Uh, the details are in the footnotes. Again, the, the footnotes are quite extensive, but really important to interpreting the full table. And there's really good details in here, as well as links to other guidance that, that will probably be relevant to people that are uh, using this table. Just point out a couple. We do define what uh, an exposure is in a little bit more detail. And then we, we do realize that most veterinary clinics do not have access to N95 respirators. And there is guidance on alternatives which includes a surgical mask and full face shield and a link to additional guidance for alternatives. Al alternative PPE. Next slide. Uh, so consider considerations for the options to recommend animals that test positive for SARS-CoV-2. Veterinarians should assess whether pets infected with SARS-CoV-2 can be cared for at home. To date, almost all animals have, have done just fine with in-home care. Uh, and most likely that will be the situation going forward. We do have some guidance on what veterinarians should be considering when deciding if in-home care is the, the correct move here. Home isolation guidance is in, is in this document. It's just a couple of bullets from, from a, a much more extensive description that is on the website. Have the pet stay in a designated sick, sick room. If direct contact with the ill animal cannot be avoided, follow similar recommended precautions as you would when dealing with a, uh, a human COVID-19 patient in your home. Uh, and while this really shouldn't be specific to SARS-CoV-2, but it is more important now, do not let cats positive for SARS-CoV-2 roam outside. If it is determined that the cat needs to be housed inside the veterinary clinic, um, again, we have much more extensive guidance on the website, but just a few key points here where possible, isolate the pet away from the patient population, ensure appropriate PPE is available and there's space to don and off in that room, uh, limit staff who have to have contact with the animal and limit visitation um, to that animal. Next slide. Returning to normal pet activities, uh, there are two ways to do this. There's a clinical assessment and there's a diagnostic assessment. The clinical assessment, I will point out, does differ from the human guidance because as you saw from some of Casey's data, uh, while very, very limited, we do have a, uh, several examples where, where uh, animals are testing positive up to about 12 days. So we were looking for at least 72 hours since their clinical signs have resolved, and then at least 14 days since clinical signs first appeared. If you're relying on diagnostic testing, their clinical signs of illness should have improved without the use of medications, and at least one of the following, a negative lab, lab test, or 14 days since their last positive test. Next slide. And we do have a section on information to tell pet owners. Uh, a lot of this information has been covered and it goes in a lot more detail on the website. So I'm not going to just read these off to you, but just know there are resources there for some questions we think will be, will be common questions from pet owners. Next slide. And then one more thing to add. This is a, a very new set of guidance that's gone up on the website just several days ago and it is what to do if your pet tests positive for the virus that causes COVID-19. This uh, represents very, very similar concepts to what we just covered in the veterinary guidance, but it is written for uh, pet owners, not for, the, for a, a technical audience like veterinarians and, and veterinary staff. Um, the, but the, the main, main points are the same. It's also written from the perspective of what you would do to, um, to care for these animals in a household rather than a clinic. Uh, I don't have time to go through these in detail, but uh, just know that they are available online. Next slide. Perfect. And um, I just want to point out this has been a, a ongoing piece of work. I joined kind of late in the game. So a lot of, a lot of the hard work that went into developing this was done uh, well before I joined. I'm sorry for, I forgot somebody who's on here because there has been you know, a lot of people that have been participating in the COVID-19 response. Then AVMA for some critical feedback that helped us make this a much more clear document and an ASPHB um, for, uh, for, for very similar reasons. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of today's speakers for their excellent presentations. Um, we only have time for a few very quick questions. Um, so we have a few questions that came in for Dr. Barton Baravesh asking if you can comment on the dog reported in North Carolina. 
Sure. Hi. So the, the dog in North Carolina, there's definitely more to learn. Again, this was a preliminary positive that was reported um, by the owners to the media. This dog was part of a university research study, and there's some additional ongoing laboratory assessments at USDA National Veterinary Services Laboratory right now, and we expect to learn more in the coming days. What's important is that animals um, that, are, that are being tested in a variety of places right now, that that information needs to be shared with state and federal officials. USDA is responsible to confirm these infections and report them to the OIE. Thanks. Thank you. And then one for Dr. Torchetti. Um, can you comment on the sensitivity and specificity of the diagnostics? Uh, we'll be working, certainly working toward that. We're actually compiling some data to send off to our um, uh, uh, scientific staff, uh, uh, sorry, statistical staff. Um, but as you know, I mean, we needed to get diagnostics up and running very, very quickly. We have high confidence, of course, in the in, in, in positives we're detecting because we're doing multiple approaches that include um, sequencing of the viral genomes. Um, and we'll continue to work toward that. Over. Thank you. Um, and then one question for Dr. Wallace. Um, coronaviruses are known to be shed in the feces much longer than the respiratory system. Is there anything in the guidance regarding litter boxes and cleaning? There is. So the, the, there is guidance in the veterinary documents related to disposal of waste, which includes feces. What might be more relevant to, to most of the situations right now coming from pet owners is in the is in the pest positive pet owner guidance uh, where, where it's stated a little bit more plain language and for for in-home uh, application and that is to wear gloves bag the feces uh, prior to disposing of it in a lined garbage bag that but that language is in uh, both documents uh, one for veterinary facility focused and one for in-home thank you Unfortunately, we're running tight on time. Um, if you have other questions for today's presenters, you will find their email addresses on the Zohu Call webpage for today's call and in today's email newsletter. Next slide, please. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is one health 2020. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by June 8th, 2020. A web on-demand video of today's call will be posted online at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash 2020 slash May dot HTML by June 9th, 2020. And to receive free CE for the web on-demand video of today's call, complete the evaluation at www.cdc.gov slash TCE online by June 9th, 2022. Next slide, please. Our next call will take place on Wednesday, June 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Please send suggestions and questions to those who call at cdc.gov. For more information and to subscribe to our email newsletter, please visit cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Thank you for your participation. This ends today's call.